I'm Basil Darris. I work at the Boston Children's Hospital. And I was asked to talk about the Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination, uh, Module 2, uh, HINE 2. Uh, in fact, this is, um, this is a talk that was prepared by Dr. Finkel and also by Christine Crosshell, who is a physical therapist at, uh, in Chicago. Um, and, uh, and here are some disclosures for Dr. Finkel. And these are my disclosures. So I don't routinely administer uh, chopping tent and hammersmith and all that, but uh, during the uh, Nusinersen studies, uh, particularly the Endear study, I have I've done a lot of, uh, uh, of these exams, the HINE 2 uh, physical examinations. But we started by this, uh, talking about the World Health Organization uh, more development uh, scale, um, which is something that we don't, you know, we, don't, we haven't used it for the Nusinersen or even for the gene th therapy studies. So um, the, I would call it as WHO. The WHO scale has some advantages because it's clinically meaningful. Uh, it does have discrete items, but it's not actually uh, a scale. But uh, if you take a look, let's say, at this item here sitting without support and then standing with assistance, we're talking about uh, a large um, increment because this was designed for normal children, not really for kids with SMA. So, um, and of course, babies who have SMA type one, they never sit without support. Um, so the increments, they seem to be high. Um, so, um, and, and there are no sort of incremental steps that would be used for a condition like, uh, like SMA. Now, the Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination was uh, developed by Lily Dubovich at the Hammersmith Hospital in London, UK, um, in collaboration with, with others. And it did apply the principles of the neonatal neurological examination that we for use in the neonatal period. And that's the exam that uh, many of us who did pediatrics we used to use in the uh, newborn nurseries to assess the uh, neurological examination of these uh, of these infants, but it was designed for evaluating infants between two and twenty four months of age. Uh, so you can see it does not actually evaluate uh, newborns under the age of uh, two two months, and of course it was not uh, designed for for SMA. It was designed to predict. Uh, the children who were going to develop cerebral palsy, um, not, not SMA. And uh, as you can see, there is a section one, uh, which is uh, it's basically a neurological examination uh, for the cranial nerves, posture and tone, reflexes and reactions and behavior. So it, it's, it's something, it's like a neurological exam for very, for your very, very, very young children. But we're going to focus on section two, which includes the motor milestones, which is a separate section, and it does include eight motor items to document the developmental progress uh, of these uh, children. There is also section three, uh, which is a behavioral uh, scale. Uh, so, so here is the, uh, the, the exam, Heine two. You can see it does consist of uh, a number of uh, a number of items, um, going from head control to sitting, uh, voluntary grasp, ability to kick and supine, rolling, crawling, standing and walking. So it goes from the easiest to to the hardest one, um, and also it goes from sort of no milestone to the left. Uh, to, towards acquisition milestones uh, to, 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 the, to the right uh, of this particular table. Um, it was, um, it initially was administered for us to be able to 
uh, assess safety in the CS3A study, uh, one of the new scenarios studies, uh, was doing a physical exam uh, after any type of uh, uh, treatment just to make sure we didn't have any adverse events. And as time went on, it became apparent that some of these infants were actually were starting to acquire milestones. So I honestly think talked to FDA, and uh, because of the fact that it seemed to be responsive, uh, it became gradually an outcome measure. But initially, it was basically uh, a physical examination. The uh, section one, in the section one of this exam, when we examine cranial nerves and reflex and all that, the items are not age dependent. Uh, but in section two, um, the determination of normality and abnormality is age dependent uh, because the milestones require different times of development. And it does allow to record the age at which milestones are achieved. Um, the, uh, the validation has been done on typically develop, developing children. Um, um, as I said, it's a, it's a well-studied uh, neurological examination for healthy or high-risk infants uh, because it is a brief, standardized, has good inter-observer reliability even in less experienced staff. The, the one limitation is that we do not have a manual, manual of procedures, and it is not designed for SMA to type 1. And there are some papers in the literature, uh, like the paper by, uh, by Romeo, Eel, Spital for premature infants, and also for SMA uh, papers by De Sanctis and Bishop, which I'm going to discuss a little later. So when to administer the, the high knee two? Uh, the patient's state is very, very important. Uh, we have to make sure that the infant is not fatigued, is not irritable, uh, and is not somnolent after a feeding. Uh, and the order of the assessment is very important. Uh, we need to avoid the testing after a blood draw or any stressful procedure when the child is going to be fussy and uh, hard to examine. So we have to keep our schedule flexible and ask the evaluators to, or the research assistant to call us when the child is ready to be examined. Um, because the child has to be in optimal behavioral uh, state, uh, it has to be alert, it has to be engaged, and of course it's going to be between feeds, but not, not very close to a feed when the child is very hungry, and not right after the child is fed because it's going to be uh, tired and uh, drowsy. So we may, we may have to uh, defer, defer the exam, or we may have to, for, for an hour or something, but we may have to go ahead and do the exam and if the child is not in a perfect behavioral condition, but in that case, we have to clearly document the child's behavioral state. Um, there, here are more administrative guidelines. Um, the, the, the child will be observed initially with a caregiver to guide administration. And I remember I used to go to do this exam and I had to wait. And I had discovered gradually the best way to do it would be to just sit there and observe. And actually not uh, test the child sometimes. I would ask the mother to help me do the exam. Um, and let's say try to bring the child in a sitting position to assess head control and all that because I realized that when the physician was getting close to the child, the child was getting very upset, very, very fasty, and I couldn't get a good result. Uh, and we talked about the uh, issue of fatigue and, um, and all that. And this is the paper by Lina Hataja, um, who was the first author in that paper that was published in General Pediatrics by Lily Dubovich um, uh, back in 1999. In fact, I had the opportunity to be introduced by Eugenia Mercury uh, to Lena about in September of this year, one, one of the meetings. I think she's from Finland, and she was. So this paper was published, and at that time, 
I don't think anyone was expecting that it was going to be so important for the conduct of these clinical trials um, for, for SMA. So also, here are some other administrative administration guidelines. Uh, proper exam surface, the fur mat, uh, proper starting position. Um, um, if, 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 if an item, uh, an, item is, uh, an item is achieved, if the moral skill is observed, even momentarily, so we don't have a particular time. It doesn't say that you have to have control for three minutes, for three, I'm sorry, for three seconds or, or 10 seconds or uh, three seconds. So uh, even if it's achieved momentarily, it does count uh, as, as an item. Um, but it has to be observed directly at that time. Uh, it's, it, it cannot come from a video or for a good remote capture or by a parental report. So it was very, very tempting to say, you know, does the child have head control? I mean, you cannot do that. Actually, this is a physical exam and the different items, they have to be observed. Uh, as far as the scoring guidelines, uh, this score, we score each item on a scale from zero uh, to three or four. You know, five is a mistake, and I'll come back to that. Um, the scale used to be one to five, but now the scale, not now, for a number of years, the scale is zero to four. So four is the maximum. So zero indicates an absence of activity, and um, several items have three levels of scoring available. Um, if we, have, if we cannot choose between two responses, uh, it is preferable to score down. Um, um, that it, 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 when it's very hard to really uh, be sure about the exact uh, response, you have difficulty choosing the figure, uh, we choose the figure that most closely resembles what the, what the infant has done. Uh, and again, the emotional state of the infant is very, very important. And if we have a symmetry where you get one on one side and get two on the other side, uh, we, use, we, t we should score the best response. So here is the, um, the, the, the scale again. And you can see on the top it says column. It says one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's not really the score. So it used to be one to five because six says observed, report, and so on. So now it's zero to four. So zero means the child is unable to do many of these milestones. And four is, is the best response. And we go, uh, you see also it does have, it does tell us, you know, at 12 months, you know, how often a child has head control, let's let, you know, you say, um, and it would be 100%, it would be, you know, and the other milestones could be 90%, it could be, uh, 79% and so on. So it does, it does give some normative data in here. Um, it would say, for example, that, you know, sitting with support is normal at four months. And it would say props, normal at six months, uh, stable seat at seven months, pivots, uh, normally hap that happens at 10 months. So it does give you some normative data, uh, which I think is uh, very useful particularly for people who are not very familiar with, the, uh, with this particular uh, examination. And here's the behavioral state. I think this is a very useful scale because you can take a look at this and you would like to hear four, fives, and six when you try to do the examination. Uh, the child has to be awake, he has to uh, be happy, uh, friendly, and all that in order to cooperate for the, uh, for the examination. Uh, this is a very important peer, uh, paper by Roberto Sanctis and others, uh, other members of the PNCR network. Uh, Eugenio Mercuri is the, is the senior author. And this paper basically confirmed what we've known for many years. And it included 33 SMA type one infants uh, all patients had a score of zero out of four on items assessing sitting, rolling, crawling, standing, or walking. But a number of them were able to achieve some, uh, had a partial response. So like one, which is like a partial response, about uh, 13 out of 33 
he had some degree of head control, you know, 15 out of 33, they had some kicking and, and all that. So, but at the same time, you can see that 20 out of 33 did not have any head control at all. And patients with symptom onset uh, after six months, they seem to have preservation of some of the movements for a longer period of time, as if they plateaued for a while. But the ones we had uh, onset before the age of six months, uh, they tended to decline very fast. And we don't actually have that many uh, type 1 babies we have onset after the age of six months, because you usually have onset before the age of six months. And no infants in the study achieved a major milestone, such as rolling over or sitting independently. And this is something we've known for years, particularly the ones who, are, who have gray hair like me. So we've seen, uh, we've noticed over the years that, if, that when we would make the f diagnosis uh, of SMA in a baby, uh, that was probably the best we could get at that time. So the child um, would come in and if it had partial health control, it would not get better. It was going to get worse. And after the baby would go downhill. So this was a very well known fact for many years, but it was important to have it actually documented with a study like this, this one here, um, because it had significant uh, importance in assessing the efficacy of some of these new treatments. And here's another paper uh, by C Kathy Bishop and uh, Richard Finkel and, uh, and, uh, and, and J Jackie Montes, uh, where this particular Hammersmith um, Part 2 uh, examination was assessed, was studied uh, during the nursing clinical uh, studies. Uh, specifically, the study was C uh, CS3A. It was a type 1 study um, that was conducted before the pivotal uh, CS3B, uh, which led to the, uh, which along with uh, the other studies led to the approval of nucinersin in December 2016. So in that particular study, um, 19 symptomatic infants with type 1 SMA uh, were, were involved in, um, and they were assessed during the HIND2 uh, at baseline before the age of seven months of age and periodically up to 39 months of age. Um, and it was found that um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the question is whether the HIND2 examination uh, was feasible, reliable, and sensitive to change. And here are the results. You can see that the motor milestone assessments in SMA infants were feasible using the, the HIND2 examination. There was very, uh, very good test, test reliability um, and the SMA infants were extremely uh, low function baseline, as we have noticed uh, most of us uh, over the years. Um, the HINI2 was able to detect uh, changes over time in 16 of 19 infants within all eight domains. Um, there, the HINI2 uh, showed improvements, it was correlated with changes in the chopping tent uh, scale and also the ulnar C map. So the conclusion of the study was the results support the use of the high need to more a milestone assessment in clinical trials of SMA infants. And here is, here is a representation of some of the results of the studies. You can see on your, on your left uh, that, there is, that there is the box there that has uh, the different milestones uh, from voluntary grass all the way down to walking. And the blue squares represent patients who received six milligrams, the red ones, the ones who received 12 milligrams, and a few yellow squares who represent the babies who had uh, three copies of SMN2. And you can see that in the, you know, m m most of these infants, they were really in the zero to one range as far as the score uh, is concerned. Uh, you know, most of them were on the left side. And then, uh, when uh, uh, a data cut was done in January 2016, and um, the, you could see that many of these babies moved to the right. You can see that uh, a lot of the, particularly the ones who received uh, 12 milligrams, they seem to have really moved to the right, which means they were able to acquire milestones. Which is sort of unusual. As I told you earlier, 
once we make the diagnosis, we, do not, we don't actually see any significant improvements. Um, and here you could see that with the treatment, uh, many of these treated infants, they seem to be acquiring milestones um, as shown on this table on your right. And now we come to individual uh, milestones with head control, uh, hand control in a sitting position. So what do we do? We support the infant with hands, at trunk, and shoulder. So we try to hold uh, the baby from the trunk and the shoulders at the same time. And then after that, we, we lower our hands. We go down to the mid-thorax uh, level to support the infant and see what's the control, what's the head control in that, in that particular position. So it does measure the ability to maintain uh, the head upright. And you can see that, um, that um, zero here is unable to maintain uh, head upright, which is normal up to three months. Um, then wobbling of the head, normal up to four months. Maintaining upright all the time, normal about five months. Uh, this is a little unusual because, you know, many of our babies, at least in this, you know, who, uh, who but particularly the African -Ameri American ones, they're able to acquire the head control much earlier what's shown here. But nevertheless, this is how the, the scale is, uh, was, was developed. So here we have a typically developing child. And you can see that the, the therapist is holding the baby by the, uh, the, the chest, as we said. And there's some wobbling there of the head. But this is the position. So whereas uh, on this one, Dr. Finkel seems to be initially holding uh, the baby. Initially was, I'll go back again. You can see he has his hand, his thumb over the shoulders, and he has his fingers behind the, the thorax here. And he's holding the baby, and you can see that th this, this baby d d does seem to hold it for at least for, uh, for, for a few seconds before coming down. And then uh, Dr. Finkel continues to torture the child. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, doing different other things that children always enjoy to do. Uh, Galant and all that. But I think you, as I said, you start from the shoulders and the upper chest and then, and then you move down to mid-thorax. I mean, that's the message here. And here it shows head control in other test measures like the, the Bailey scales of infant development and the difference in chopping 10. You can see the difference between the between Heine 2 and these other scales is that you see a lot of seconds here and timing and all that. Uh, so item 4 means that lifts head for 3 seconds, you know, support and so on. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the Heine 2 is not... Uh, very quantitative. And here we come to sitting. You can see that zero cannot sit. One sits with support of the hips. So the therapist or the physician holds the baby here at the hips, which um, uh, and, and you can sit normal at four months. And then props, uh, normal at six months. Um, stable seat at seven to eight months. Uh, pivots. <laughs> rotates normal at eight, nine months, meaning they're sitting there and was able to rotate and pick up toys and st stuff like that. So, and here is the, uh, I think this is not a video, Richard. And this is like, it shows uh, the, uh, a nice uh, propping maneuver uh, position. Um, so this is zero, one, two, three, four. And this is very nice uh, stable seat. Um, very similar to, what's, to what, the, what this figure shows here. And then we have a typically developing a normal child at seven weeks. 
uh, held by the hips. And you see that the head, the baby's holding the head and they're also trying to sit. Seems to go down. So what? <laughs> And then it's all with SMA, and you see I, I, this child is, is, must be treated because sitting, and you can see that his sitting is, is very good. Um, and again, there are other measures of sitting, and you may know that in some recent studies, like the uh, gene therapy studies, uh, uh, START and, uh, and STRIVE, um, uh, sitting was defined, if I remember well, uh, uh, sitting without support for, 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 for 30 seconds. So there are different ways to do it. You know, if you use the Bailey scales of infant development, but the chop, chop in 10 does not have any sitting items. And now kicking, you know, you have here no kicking at zero, uh, kicks horizontally, legs do not lift, um, upward vertically, uh, movements of the legs, Normal at three months, uh, touches the legs. Normal at four to five months, touch the toes. Normal at five to six months, and you can see that um, I think this is uh, yeah, it's not a video, but you can see that. So th this one is probably I would say that. Um, it's probably just kick, kicks horizontally, but it's not lifting up the, uh, the legs the way we see it here. Uh, so this one will be one, and this one will be four, uh, touching the toes. So it's basically a lot of observation that we do when we do this exam. And um, this is uh, a normal baby at 12 days. You can see it seems to be moving the legs very, very, very nicely but they do not sort of horizontally, they don't seem to be elevating up. And this is um, a complex figure from the, the Sanctus paper. And the, the idea is that, you know, um, a baby who had a score of zero, for example, here, does not seem to be getting any better, you know, as far as kicking is concerned. And a baby who had uh, a score of one, continues one, and then goes down to zero. So it seems to be getting worse. So this is natural history study of SMA type one. And here's comparison to the Bailey scales infant development, uh, and also the chop, chop antenna here. You see there are periods of time, how many seconds, and so on. And here we have the voluntary grasp. In the voluntary grasp, it is included in the HINE 2 examination, but it is not, um, uh, it was not used during the analysis of the Endear study uh, data because it was thought, uh, grasp is thought to be a developmental skill. It's not actually, you don't need a lot of strength to do, you know, pins and grasp and all that. Uh, was felt to be sort of like, um, um, you know, a, a developmental milestone that it did not have too much relevance to what we're trying to assess, you know, by um, uh, when we give medications like um, nucinersin or doing gene therapy. So this one was excluded from the final analysis. And here is um, a normal uh, seven-week-old baby, and this is uh, Palmer Grasp, um, who is we see early in life, and is totally normal. Um, compared to um, a baby here with, with, with SMA who has been treated at 12 months, was presymptomatic, I think, um, um, and seems to be doing very well. So pulling up to, sit in, to the sitting position, very good head control. He has a little temper. And then Dr. Finkel tries to do the, the, the pincer grasp, but the first time he failed. And then, and then the baby seems to pull it.
so so these are the things you can and and then weight bearing to some extent and then parachuting Very nice. And here, a comparison of Grasshopper to the other scales. You can see how detailed is the the Bailey scale. You know, with uh, all all these things, all these items here. And then we come to proposition and crawling. And I, I do like these figures. I remember when I used to go to examine these kids, I was looking at the stick figures and try to decide how you know, what, what the baby was doing, you know, you know, um, it was, it was so scientific. So, you know, <laughs> so, so, so here you are and you have like, uh, this one looks like probably like a one here. And I would say that although for two, you expect a full extension of the elbows, I think this baby is doing pretty well. So I would probably give this baby a two, um, uh, but um, here is a baby who's only three days old. Kicks to try to do something, but the head is is down. But all the baby's only th three days. You don't expect anything better than that. And then, and then you have fifteen day old. He seems to be lifting the legs up and all that. But the point that. Uh, Dr. Fingal tries to make in this uh, particular uh, talk with these uh, 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 videos is that it's very hard to examine SMA babies in this position. And if they have SMA, as you know, they have diaphragmatic breathing. And if you put them in your belly, you push the, you know, the, the belly pushes down against the examination table. So it doesn't make it more difficult for them to breathe. And this is, this is um, a difficult um, thing to do. Um, I thought we had another video, but but again, prone is something that um, is, is 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 a difficult position for the babies who have uh, SMA type one. Uh, there are no prone items in shop intent, and then rolling, um, um, like rolling over, as we say, uh, no rolling zero. Rolling to the side, which is normal at four months, you get one uh, prone to supine and supine to prone at six months and all that. And if you take a look at the Bailey scales, uh, item 20 says rolls from back to sides. Item 25 rolls from back to stomach. And the top intent uh, facilitated rolling. Item 6 elicited from legs and item 7 elicited from the arms. So it's important. Uh, does not capture dependent rolling, but in this video here, you see that the child is trying. You know, it's almost tries to roll over, and almost there. Just the arm is caught. Cannot actually pull the arm out of that of the position. So, and uh, the point that this particular video makes is that um, you don't get perfect rolling over, but whatever you get, you should document it. You just make a note in your physical exam so that you have something to compare with during the next physical examination. So, and then standing uh, does not support weight, supports weight, uh, supports stands with support, stands unaided, and so on. There are no standing items in chop intent. And then, and then we have walking, uh, bouncing, uh, cruising, walking, holding on. So we know what cruising is, holding on to the furniture, for example. Then walking independently. And b b bouncing, w what it is, is basically um, uh, I guess to bending the knees. Um, because it's an English, it's an English word. I guess I didn't uh, even myself. I didn't know exactly the <laughs> yeah. So, so that's what it means. <laughs> um, 
And then there are some uh, videos here on YouTube. Uh, to sh they show how to score the different items in Heine, in Heine too. And um, again, I'm not. I've done a lot of these physical exams, but the Heine two exams. But I'm not in, an expert in chopping ten and you know the other scales and all that. But you know, if you have any questions, Dr. Finkel is here. <laughs> Yes. I, I, I have a quick question on those. <laughs> 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 Don't throw that at me. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the rolling items, so you're saying that ooh, the um, the arms do not matter. Um, sorry, I, I kind of missed that. I was just curious. No, I didn't say the arms do not matter. I said if score. you I mean, <laughs> if they get caught, they ha we have to document that, right? <laughs> so the the challenge is that. There was no manual procedures with yeah. the Heine. Um, so when we started it, it was simply following it as best we could. Uh, there's an opportunity now to be more precise uh, and say, does it to roll over from supine to prone, does it really require clearing the arm to get a full score, yeah. as it would in some other scales? Uh, so that's part of the, the future. I think uh, if you're evaluating a baby uh, and you have your score sheet because we we keep a little file of these and every baby they every time they come into the clinic we we do the chop and tend and hiney um, we write down some notes because otherwise you can't at least I can't remember four months later did the baby clear the arm or not so sometimes you you need to elaborate a little bit in your report uh, to say oh he's clearly improving because you may not capture that he may maybe he rolled over but didn't clear the arm and then four months later he cleared the arm so you know, those are the kind of things that uh, are, are important. So to Tina's question, I think that's, uh, that's important, for, not just for this one item, but for several of them, because um, it's, it's, this is not quite as granular, as certainly as the Bailey or the, the chop and tend. So, so Dr. Pickle, would you have scored the baby a, um, a four if the arm was stuck? Just, I was just curious of how. I'm yes, because he rolled, he okay. did roll, but um, you know, you, you and the, and the thing is, uh, there are no half scores, half points. Yeah. So to me, uh, that one of the opportunities is to say, should there be a three and a half or something where you you roll but you don't clear the arm? You know, that that hasn't been decided yet. But in that case, you would give a three probably, right? Or, well, but or? the three is uh, rolling from uh, halfway prone to supine. Go back, you'll see it doesn't have. Just uh, no. Let me see. So three is uh, zero. Uh, z oh no, <coughs> zero. I meant. Uh, would you call it one? Because it does not do the whole. Because you said you have to scale down. So just to make a comment, I, I really like how you put in the additive chop and tan and the Bailey, and we'll also go through the additive, the Hammersmith Extended. It, it'll give you the nuances of how, what are you looking for and how you're scoring. I think the scoring and what you're looking for are two different things. And, and when you think about goal setting, you really have to think about all the different elements, you know, rolling to your side so you get the pelvis vertical, coming into prone so that they're horizontal to the ground, then uh, the lateral extension of the head and the neck extension and then the bearing and release of the arm. So those, those are all the different elements of rolling. But you can use each of those elements into your different parts of your goal setting and to, to, to monitor progress along the way. They can meet part of the, the, all the elements or they can meet all the elements in fooling. The score just monitors whether you are improving on an overall scale or on an individual item. Let me just make a plea that um, for those of you that will be doing these scales, um, whether it's the chop and tend or the hiney, remember that um, these are not only important for you being able to monitor how the baby's doing in response to treatment, but the insurance companies look at this very carefully. And uh, <clears throat> some of the insurers will uh, authorize the treatment, uh, but you have to reauthorize it. And they want to see progress. So if a baby did well one visit, and, an, and maybe the next time was a little sick, uh, had just gotten over an illness, or was having a stinky day, and just 
you know, didn't want to have any part of you um, and didn't score so well, put that in your note as a qualifier. It's really important because you don't want the insurer to say, oh, he, he went down, you know, and he's, not, he's a non-responder and we're not going to reauthorize. So that, that's quite important. And then the second thing is, um, as, as much as you want to give the baby credit for everything, restrain yourself and from giving the baby a mark for what the mother showed you on a video, what he did yesterday at home. You, because you know, it really has to be observed. Because you don't really exactly know what the, how the situation was. Was it the firm surface, all the right things, you know, the way that you're doing it? Was the starting position correct? Uh, so, you know, you, you realize the baby may not do their best when you see them, but that's really the proper way to do it. Uh, Richard, I have a question. Um, we've seen that this has been validated for uh, two months and up. In the area where we're going to start treating the patients earlier, in the first weeks of life, what are going to be the scales that we will be using? Right. So you're exactly right. The, the, um, the Hammersmith neonatal exam was supposed to go up to two months, and then this, the high knee, the infant neurologic exam was supposed to go from two to 24 months. Uh, so it wasn't designed for that, but in fact, um, we've been using it, um, and it seems to show both... Uh, good reliability in in the young infants. Um, most uh, most of the type one babies in the studies were more than two months of age. There were, there were some that were six weeks or so, but we didn't have too many in the studies under uh, under two months. So most of them were two to six months uh, in the clinical trials. But it seems like in a weak baby, it, it still works. That, that's both feasible, uh, and by feasibility we mean that the baby tolerates it, and that you you seem to have good test, retest, reliability, those sorts of things. It should take three to five minutes, you know. It should, and the timing is really critical, you know. Uh, so if they're coming in for uh, to see you for a therapy session, uh, then you can try to time it, you know, best. If they're coming in for a whole clinic visit and you're seeing them. You need to get your elbows out, and you need to get to see the baby first before the darn neurologist starts getting them fussy. Okay? <laughs> one, one additional question to that. So one of the first findings that we see in the a typical normal newborn is like the predominantly uh, flexor tone in both upper and lower extremities. Would that change what we see in the score later on or not? Yes, because you're right. That when they have the fact that in that first month to six weeks when they have a lot of increased flexor tone, they score higher on the chop and tend um, and also on the high knee. Uh, then they, and then that looks like they dip a little bit when they start to relax a little and do that reciprocal kind of kicking and sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, you, you have to, and that's why it's important to qualify it. You know, sometimes, you know, the parents will say, oh, he, he rolled over at three weeks. Well, he did because he had that flexor tone and some, he I don't know he coughed and rolled over, you know, <laughs> but uh, but it wasn't a you know a, a, an evolutional sort of thing. So yeah, exactly. Good. Well, I hope you you practice this because it's it's actually not hard. That I think the hard part is the scoring, and we tried to show you some of the nuances. Hopefully, there will be a better manual procedures and you know something that will evolve. But it's. It, it seems to fit a nice gap between the who, which is the steps, as Dr. Dare says, are just too big. They're not, it's not really as useful. Uh, and the chop and tend, which isn't really milestone dr driven. So it sort of fits in between. Okay, Great. dismissed. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.